Welcome to Whiskey Lore, The Interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon best-selling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experience in Kentucky Bourbon. And today, we're going to turn the clock back to the 19th century and learn about a whiskey that was famous the world over, but one that you may not have heard of. But that's something we're going to change today with my guest, Bill McBrayer of McBrayer Legacy Spirits. And about 10 years ago, he stumbled into a family legacy in distilling that was even bigger than he probably imagined it was and it all started with a man named Nick or who a man who was nicknamed the judge and we're going to learn all about him and Cedar Brook which was the brand that he made famous and we'll also find out how Bill is honoring the legacy of this one time whiskey baron and we're going to taste some of his spirits so we've got lots of history little family dispute and a tie into the whiskey trust and the tasting. So let's go ahead and dive right into my conversation with Bill McBrayer. Bill, welcome to the show. Drew, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yes, this is one of those. As I look across Kentucky and I see new brands coming up and, you know, you you start going, okay, that looks like a a legacy brand. I wonder what the story is behind that. Uh, That's how I bumped into uh, McBrayer. W.H. McBrayer, and um, you know, you look at the packaging and you think, yes, there's there's definitely got to be a story back here, or did we do like George Dickel and just kind of come up with a face on a, on a package, although there was a man behind that as well, but um, talk about how you discovered this uh, family legacy. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it was about nine, almost ten years ago, as you had mentioned, um, I had a daughter, she was looking to go to college. And I was looking at Center College in Danville for her to look at it. And I was telling my dad about it. And he said, well, you know, the McBrayers gave some money to that college. And I said, well, who are you talking about? And he said it was the McBrayer in the whiskey business. Well, I remember when I was a kid in the, in the late in the 70s, my dad was a sales guy. And there was a brand called Old McBrayer that we had all heard of. And he said he would give it to his customers at Christmas time. And he turned around. Next time he saw them, they'd give it back to him and said, this is really bad. Don't give us this anymore. And, 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 and as a family member, I just knew there was a brand called Old McBrayer, and and um, it was not very good. And at that time, it was made uh, by National Distillers, but it was a blended whiskey, right? And mm. I've seen some of those bottles from the 70s. It was like 65% uh, neutral grain spirits. It was really bad stuff, right? And so um, so anyways, my dad, when he would said that uh, somebody had given – money the university he said it was a guy in the whiskey business i'm looking for the mcbrayer scholarship at center college i, I was just like hey if there's a, a scholarship here my my kid's gonna really take a good serious look at this because you know she's gonna apply for it well there wasn't one and i just so happened to be home uh, that weekend by myself and and i looked up mcbrayer whiskey and i came across a blog post by jack sullivan on prepro.com and it was the story of William Harris and McBrayer, the judge. And I read this story and I was like, oh my gosh, this guy was awesome. <laughs> right. And yeah. he, how he had uh, won the gold medal a couple times around the world. There was family lawsuits and all these other things. And I literally just became obsessed with the, the story. Um, I don't think I worked for about six weeks. I was just on the internet <laughs> doing research. Right. And, and, um, and we, we are very fortunate as a family. We have, We've been studying our genealogy as a, a family for multiple generations, and I met with some family historians. I, like I said, I was probably on page 200 on Google or something, you know, looking up different things. And there was so much history out there. Um, I just got obsessed with it, and and you know, started this business uh, with the goal of just reintroducing William Harris McBrayer, the judge, one of Kentucky's most iconic distillers. Uh, to yeah. the community, bourbon community. And so, so that's how inter- I got started. So it was interesting when I was out in California chasing after the um, Leonis story, we were looking through the bottles of pre-prohibition whiskey that they had hidden away in the vault for a century. And as we were going through, I saw the kind of paper packaging around the Cedar Brook brand. I looked closely at it and I said, oh, this is interesting. I've, I've never seen this before. I don't know whether that bottle, because they had added some additional bottles to that collection, you know, over over the years. But I mean, it was. Uh, I think this was actually a 
bottle that came from just after Prohibition or somewhere around that time. So how long did that brand stay around? Well, um, the Cedar Brook brand was probably reintroduced somewhere in the 1850s. Um, William Harrison McBrayer, he started his distillery in 1844. And, you know, he um, it is on the Cedar Creek property. It is a nice windy piece uh, brook through there. And it was called uh, Cedar Creek or Cedar Run. I've seen it uh, different ways. Um, but they, uh, his wife urged him to change the name from, it used to be the W.H. McBrayer Distillery, it was number 44, uh, to Cedar Brook. And uh, they said they called it Cedar Brook because uh, the river had this like audible uh, babbling sound like a poet, and they, so they called it a brook. And um, uh, so it started in the 1850s was the brand came out, uh, known as Cedar Brook, formerly W.H. McBrayer. And the brands actually survived into the 1960s, 1970s. I don't know exactly when Cedar Brook stopped. Mm -hmm. um, I do know older McBrayer stopped somewhere in the eight, 1980s. Um, and, um, um, you know, the, but the family got out of the business and it sold to the Whiskey Trust in the late, uh, early 1900s. And so, uh, but what really was uh, interesting to me was when Julius Kessler was selling the brand, it was sold as the most famous brand in the world. Mm. And it said it right on the bottles and some of his ads. And uh, it really prompted me to understand more. I'm like, wow, how is something that we've never heard of as McBrayers yeah. that famous? Like, I need to retell this story. And that's really what happened. So W.H. McBrayer... He was not a first-generation American like sometimes we hear these distillers. You know, they they came over from Ireland or Scotland and then started up their business. But uh, he actually was um, born in America. Mm -hmm. And how many generations back do you know? Yeah, does the family yes. go? Well, yeah, I'm a ninth-generation McBrayer here. Um, uh, William Harrison, he was a third generation, so. Uh, three brothers came over here. Um, they fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, they were based out of Pennsylvania. Um, his grandfather was James. Um, James's brother was William. I'm from the William brother. Uh, and, and James is, you know, so he's a distant cousin, I would say, right? William Harrison is a distant cousin of mine. I, I'm not that good to tell you. We're yeah. Yeah, 17th removed or whatever it is. Yeah. But <laughs> we're definitely on the same family tree. There's no doubt about it. And his his um, uncle, right? His his fought one of his his dad's brothers was older, and he was a surveyor. And he came over in the James Harold settlement, um, surveyed the wilderness trail, and um, really fell in love with it. Uh, went back and got his family, and they all settled there in the Lawrenceburg. One of the first settling families in the Lawrenceburg community. Um, I've read. I haven't found the papers. You know, they were granted a couple hundred acres due to their service in the war. And um, they started their family uh, farm there. And uh, that's that's how the McBrayers ended up in Lawrenceburg. Nice. And they also had a mercantile, did they not? A, a general store or something? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting um, story there. So W.H.'s sister was... Her name was Mary. She was about 10 years older. He was one of 11 children uh, back then. He was, I think, the seventh one. And his sister, um, she was about 10 years older, and her husband, Andrew C., they had a, he was a merchant. And he actually passed away when he was 35 years old. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but he was very successful at an early age. And the William Harrison and his brothers helped his sister by taking over the merchant's store. And so he, he then took over the store and, from his brothers, and he was a merchant, and he was a merchant for the rest of his life uh, uh, mm. in that area in that time frame. And, and you have to know, like in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky at that time, it was their store and maybe another store. <laughs> you know, okay. there wasn't that many people, right? And, um, and so he had his merchant store. He got into it when he was 18 years old, um, around 1844 or so. Um, so he, it was a few years later, um, he bought his property to put his distillery on uh, out there at, at the Cedar Brook uh, property. And uh, it was just a little, you know, very primitive hut that they started with. And um, he, But he had his distilling uh, businesses as well. 
And whiskey was such an important piece of life on the frontier at that time. And you just wonder, we associate in the late 19th century grocers with rectifying whiskey. Mm-hmm. And you wonder if he was potentially rectifying whiskey and that's what prompted him to say, hey, maybe I should go out and get my own farm. Yeah, you know, we don't know that. Um, we do know that a lot of times people drank whiskey instead of water back then just because it was cleaner. And yeah. so, um, but, you know, when, as he built up his distillery, I mean, he he used uh, probably the most, you know, best ingredients. It, he was known for the quality of his product. And um, and it's been, it was an interesting journey just learning that and, and, and getting to understand all that. Uh, uh you know, was just a fascinating story for me to learn. Yeah. So how did he end up with the nickname, the judge? Sure. Uh, so he became the first judge in Anderson County in 1851 and they called him the judge. And that, that moniker just stuck with him the rest of his life. Um, he, in about five years later, around 1856, he became a state Senator, uh, for the state of Kentucky. Um, the, their family is real involved in the politics of the of the area and the community. Uh, did that to the early 1860s, um, and and then he started to you know start to pay attention more to his distilling business. Uh, started you know spending more time with it, um, and started to grow that. And then you know around you know obviously in the 1860s to 65, you know, we had our Civil War, and and so many people came to Kentucky and drank the whiskey and then they went back to their home states and was like man i really miss that whiskey from kentucky <laughs> and, and you know kentucky whiskey started to build this reputation as a great spirit around you know the 1860s and and um you know the mcbrayer name between him and his cousin uh jh mcbrayer uh it became known as they made great whiskey back then yeah so talk about um his cousin because uh he had a different farm, Hammond Creek. Yeah, he was understand. over on yeah, uh, J, John Henry. We call him J H McBrayer. We had W H and J H. Um, he started his first distillery in 1848 around Hammond's Creek. Um, he did not ever get real scalable and big, like, uh, but he was involved in different distilleries throughout his lifetime. Um, I'm not sure what happened much with the Hammond's Creek location, other than um, it, it was started by him. Um, he came back up later in 1870 uh, when he bought uh, he bought a, a distillery over in New Market, Kentucky from Howard Barnes and Company and named it the Old McBrayer Distillery. And so it was distillery number 17. And mm. so he owned that for a little while and then um, it was a, you know, a handful of years later, not sure why, uh, William Harrison ended up buying that from him as well. And so he had the Old McBrayer Distillery and he also had the Cedarbrook Distillery there for a short time, and so that's where it gets a little confusing because you have Old McBrayer whiskey, but that wasn't originally associated with W. H. McBrayer. It was with his second cousin. It was with his second cousin, and um, and that that brand had an interesting history upon itself uh, with different owners and um, different distilleries or different um, distributors. You know, um, the distributors for both Old McBrayer as well as Cedarbrook were actually here in Cincinnati where I live today. And W.W. W. Johnson was the uh, distributor for Old McBrayer. And they ended up buying the distillery uh, from William Harrison McBrayer. And, and then they sold it and then they bought it back. And eventually um, that one actually got purchased by E.H. Taylor. Okay. And so um, that was in the eighteen like eighty five or so, and so um, E H Taylor has been connected to our brands, um, and then we have a long history of legacy people that have been part of the McBrayer family uh, in the whiskey business. So one of the names that ties in, and the reason why, after a while, I said I got to get you on the show, <laughs> was because we had uh, Thomas Rippey. Um, the show not too long ago and he was talking about a lot of the lawrenceburg families and of course he is and the rippies were the forerunners to wild turkey and yet when you look back at that time period there was actually a connection between the mcbrayers and the rippies so kind of go over that 
Well, first off, Tom, Tom is such a wealth of knowledge. Um, what a great, great person to still be involved in the bourbon community. Uh, there at the Rippy House in Lawrenceburg with uh, their bourbon sessions they have uh, put on. They were nice. They were, they've were. they been super nice to us, knowing that we're, our families are from Lawrenceburg. Um, we had the opportunity to speak down there uh, at the, when we introduced our first batch of whiskey uh, last April. And... Um, and so T. B. Rippey actually worked for McBrayer uh, in the in the 1860s, and then uh, William Harrison actually helped him buy his first distillery in 1869, mm. um, and then uh, T. B. bought him out a year later, um, and um, obviously that distillery became a man a big company, and yeah. which is now today Wild Turkey, and um, you know, and I've read different things along the way. Um, you know, Rippy might have probably he probably had the biggest distillery in Lawrenceburg, you know, at that time. But they said Cedar Brook was by far the most famous. And, okay. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, again, we're we're looking at a lot of different history. We're talking about how, trying to find stuff from 150 years ago, <laughs> you know, or 170 years ago, or whatever it is, right? And the records aren't the best, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know um, the Rippy family and and what they've done and the McBrayers that what they had done in the whiskey business down there and there was others you know Bond and Lillard and and then some of the other folks that had come from the different distilleries uh, you know Larsberg was a pretty big spot for whiskey uh, there in Anderson County they were all making great products yeah there was even a tie-in actually to um, what is now Four Roses. Mm-hmm. which the old Prentice Distillery, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but I came across it the other day, a postcard that is a picture of the Spanish mission architecture of Four Roses. It's a postcard from about 1915, and mm-hmm. the location is McBrayer, Kentucky. It, yeah, it, that was another rabbit hole I went down in our research. When you actually <laughs> drive into Four Roses, when you go over the railroad tracks, if you look to the left, there's the McBrayer sign is there still today. Oh, wow. And that, that was considered McBrayer Crossing because Mc, WH, as part of his um, influence in the government, um, he was part of making the, having the railroad come through Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. And when you read some of his things, it actually most people think that's one of his major accomplishments that he did for the community, uh, putting the railroad through there. And um, um, at Later on, they named that little section uh, McBrayer, Kentucky. Um, it no longer is considered a city. It's now part of Lawrenceburg. Yeah. Um, and, and what's really interesting to me is that when you are at Four Roses across the street, there are three old Rick houses. Um, they are actually owned by the Wild Turkey folks, but those are known as the McBrayer Rick houses. And are they? they say okay. The, they say they are some of the oldest Rick houses. Uh, I mean, Kentucky still standing today. Wow. So we know that the brand grew large, but it also had a great reputation because E.H. Taylor even talked about how great the whiskey was. He ended up buying into it. So uh, so that says something. But, uh, but also it, it had won some awards, a- including in Europe. Yeah. Um, it, t- it took a little while to find this one. There was actually an old book I found in the... Lawrenceburg Library that started in 1888 or something like that, finished in 1914. And it talked about um, how Cedar Brook won the gold medal in Vienna, Austria in 1873 for the gold medal uh, for the best whiskey in the world. And at that time, um, it said it turned the crown heads in Europe from Scotch to Kentucky whiskey or bourbon. Um, And, you know, it started to put, they say it put bourbon kentucky bourbon on the international map Mm. you know um and his spirits really helped with that um they they also in some of the ads that julius kessler had in the early 1900s it was the drink the aristocrats drank right was cedar brook and i i've not found the evidence although i've had people tell me this that king george wanted it for his inauguration uh, wow cedar brook brand that stuff from kentucky and so um so that was pretty amazing and, but what we we had heard more so was how he won the gold medal at the Philadelphia Centennial in 1876, and so um, so he was making some great products and and it was amazing to me that very few people really knew about it. Yeah, 
what what would be fascinating, but we can never do it, is <laughs> taste what that whiskey was like. My guess is, at that time, they were still probably transporting it in barrels, and it wasn't being bottled, because bottling mm-hmm. was still something that was fairly new around the 1870s in terms of mm-hmm. mass production of whiskey with, with bottles. So. Yeah. No telling what a whiskey would taste like after it's been in a barrel for a hundred and <laughs> it would be gone. <laughs> well, we were very fortunate enough over at the Bardstown Bourbon Company and their vintage collection. They have some Cedar Brook from 1896. Wow. And and so it isn't this 1873 product, um, but it, and it was great. You know, I mean, it, it was um, sweet on the front. It had a little bite on the back. I think it was a higher corn uh, mash bill. And... Um, you know, they talked about aging it eight years versus four years. Um, so they said they aged it twice as long than the average distiller. So they said it tasted twice as good. But, yeah, yeah. you know, the um, – um, but, yeah, I mean, to to see what he did with his brands and to grow in those brands. And it was always about quality for him, you know, being really conscious about putting out quality products. And, you know, a lot of times um, – you know, back then the the rectifiers and things they were they were pirating the the McBrayer name as well, and so he he got involved in in uh, it was like in 1882 in the Bomford Wine and Spirits uh, publication. He wrote a three paragraph publication about how unscrupulous you know people were putting the McBrayer name on stuff that wasn't his, mm. and so he actually went back to adding his name to all the bottles. So it was W. H. McBrayer's Cedar Brook Whiskey, yeah, and uh, to make sure that that was the best he could at that time to make sure people knew that it was his. And um, um, it, it is interesting to see how the name has been used over the years. Yeah, it makes you wonder when they did start bottling, because obviously they were bottling during his lifetime. Yeah, I mean, I think, don't we think, know that it was uh, Old Forester, it was maybe around 1870 when they first started bottling whiskey, right? Yeah. So probably not much longer after that. Yeah. And, uh, oh, go ahead. we, We have some pictures of some old bottles. They're not great pictures. Around those, it had to be around that 1870 time frame. Okay. Well, the one that you tasted, I think that's a great time period to taste it because it was around 1899, 1901 that the whiskey trust started to rise back up again after it had been tamped down and it had split into multiple different branches and mm-hmm. one of those branches was the Julius Kessler branch, the Kentucky I forget what they called it, the Kentucky Warehouse Association or something like Mm -hmm. that. Uh, Yeah. And so you tasted it before the Whiskey Trust took it over. Now, the thing about the original Whiskey Trust is that they were probably more interested in grain spirits than they were in producing rye whiskey and producing bourbon. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure with all the brands that Kessler took over, they probably weren't messing too much with it uh, then, but that you got a chance to taste it before that, I think, yeah, is I think, important. So, so D. L. Moore, um, his son-in-law, took over the distillery with his grandchildren, um, and he passed away in in uh, eighteen eighty-eight. W. H. did, and so he kept on. He held on to it until eighteen ninety-eight or nineteen eighteen ninety-nine. So. I believe that was D.L. Moore's bottling before whiskey, uh, before the Whiskey Trust uh, purchased it, and um, and that's a whole other story, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he took over the distillery and, and his grandchildren and, and and all the other folks that were involved with him um, at that time, and um, um, so that was that was Mick Brayer's stuff through his son-in-law, right yeah. before then. So. Well, let's let's talk about before we jump into the family scandal. That went on. I guess it's not really a scandal, more of a lawsuit. But um, Judge McBrayer actually helped get a couple of other brands that we know kicked up and running as well. So mm-hmm. maybe give a little story behind those two. Yeah. So um, so obviously we talked about T.B. Rippey working for him. Um, W.B. Saffel, 
he was his master distiller for i think twenty five years and mm-hmm. as as he was getting to the end of um, his career, uh, William Harrison was they started another distillery together. It started out as the w h McBrayer distillery in the mid 1880s and it was meant for w b Saffold to take over and um, so that became the w b Saffold distillery right there in Lawrenceburg as well and um, and then you know he willed um, he willed his Cedar Brook distillery to his uh, grandchildren when he passed away. Now, whether he knew he was going to pass away or not, I'm not really sure. But uh, he also he was involved in another distillery uh, for his adopted uh, his adopted son. Um, so his, as I had mentioned, uh, his sister Mary. Um, so his sister Mary, um, she was a widow and she had remarried um, a doctor there in Lar- in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, and it was Doctor Dixon Deadman, and they had a child together, and it was. Charles Mortimer Dedman. Um, his father, Dixon, had passed away like a year later after he was he was born. And then Mary passed away when he was about six years old and he was orphaned. Um, and then he was adopted by his uncle, the judge, uh, William Harris McBrayer. And um, and he raised him as his son, uh, you know, his, his entire life. And for his wedding present, um, he gave him the money and land to start his distillery, which we know today as Kentucky Owl. Wow. Yeah, lots of names. That, and again, when you're looking back and you're seeing that you own the Cedarbrook brand, to see how much you know the the, the uh, branches kind of passed off to other brands, and and I mean the it'd be interesting to kind of get into the mind of somebody like W H and how how giving he was in getting all of these different people started he must have had a great reputation he did um you know the um a lot of people have told me that he is he was e.h taylor of his time before e.h taylor because e.h mm-hmm. taylor really got started you know i don't know 1870s or so i mean he was significantly younger than w.h mcbrayer and so I mean, he was a generation behind a lot of the brands that you hear today uh you know, he was he was way earlier, and so yeah. when th- people talk about, oh yeah, this brand started in 1870, I'm like, yeah, that was <laughs> we, we got you by like a whole generation, you know, yeah. and um, um, and so you know he he was E H Taylor for H Taylor. He gave um, he was a very charitable man. They were a very giving family. Um, there was a university that was started, uh, cent- Center Col- Central College, and they had given like twenty five thousand dollars at that time to help start that university that's what that became merged with center college so that's and that's how we ended up that's how i went down my rabbit hole you know the whole center experience was thrown through that donation at that time and he was known for doing all kinds of good deeds he was a political figure in the community uh they helped start basically the presbyterian church at the time um they were very involved in their community um his daughter, who had three children, had passed away, uh, and they were raising their three grandchildren, as well as his adopted son, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and so that, that that was pretty interesting to learn that and just what it was like back then, you yeah. know, as families had to just pull together to to help each other and, and how unselfish people were, or they were at least, at that time. Yeah. There's, there's a McBrayer cemetery isn't there is that where he's buried well there yeah the, yes um there is a mcbrayer c- cemetery in lawrenceburg i have not been to it it's up on the hill i've i've had some people said that they get up there take me up there to it and um um and some of the old property that mcbrayer had had you know obviously it's been split up today um i have tried to go out and see the cedar brook distillery but it's on some private property and mm. i was told you don't want to really walk out there by yourself <laughs> <laughs> you might not make it out yeah. and um um and so yeah he he was very uh, uh charitable if you will and and really far seeing right they said he talked about it's far seeing uh looking ahead of things and and um being involved in the whiskey and being able to build those brands and and um you know we had but there was also some controversy that came with our family too which also just added to the story yeah right? um so you know when when he passed away uh his will said he wanted his name stricken from the brands three years after his use even though he given 
the the distillery to his grandchildren and then he helped his son and build a distillery or give him money he didn't want his name associated with it if you read it you know uh literally right mm-hmm. and and we have to remember when you read these things from the 1860s and 70s and 80s they spoke differently than we speak today yeah right and so uh but there was a lawsuit about that so um, after three years, um, his son-in-law D.L. Moore, who was married to Mary or Henrietta, his daughter, um, he was a distiller. Um, he had the D.L. Moore Distillery over around the Harrodsburg area. Um, he had got he sold that, uh, came over, ran the Cedarbrook Distillery for ten years, um, and after three years, um, there was a lawsuit with him and, and his wife Mary about the use of the McBrayer name uh, to the uh, to the brands, and um, she, you know she was a very devout. Uh, Presbyterian, uh, they very involved in church, um, and that was that was a contentious time, right? With the rise of the temperance movement, it was starting to happen, and some other things were happening. But so she she didn't want his name associated with it. However, D. L. Moore said, you know, that's not what he wanted. What he had <laughs> meant was that my estate was. Uh, for you know, my estate has nothing to do with the distillery after three years. So if this something happened to the distillery or whatever, they wouldn't come after his estate and his wife. Yeah. And so at least that's how it was presented by D.L. Moore in the lawsuit. Um, it took a couple of um, iterations and a couple of con- uh, it got contested a couple times, but the state senate ruled in D.L. Moore's favor. Um, he had argued that the brands at that time. Were worth over two hundred thousand dollars just the use of his name in the Cedar Brook, which I was like, "Oh my gosh, that that's a lot. that was yeah, a big deal." Translated and, into and today's s- money, yeah, it's several millions of dollars today just yeah. the brand itself, right? And um, and so um, so he was able to continue to use the McBrayer name associated with the brands, and and I'm so happy he he won that case um, because who knows what we would have found today? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and then after that, he held on to it for about 10 years before uh, it went on to the Whiskey Trust. But Mm -hmm. did he have both Cedarbrook and the old McBrayer name going at the same time? Do we know? Yeah, no. So so the old McBrayer brand, like I said, uh, around 1870, or I'm sorry, around 1885 is when E.H. Taylor uh, had purchased that brand. Okay. And he ran, and then he ran the new market. Uh, distillery for a long time and then eventually um he built uh the the old t- well the h taylor the old taylor what is now castle and key distillery there in frankfurt yeah and and i have uh records of actually jh mcbrayer working for e.h taylor in frankfurt kentucky so i'm pretty sure the old mcbrayer brand was made at what is now the castle and key distillery um in the early 1900s Okay. And so, so they had owned the brand in the 19, early 1900s. The Whiskey Trust owned the Cedarbrook brand. And um, after Prohibition, well, during Prohibition, um, Old McBrayer was a big, big brand. It was sold during Prohibition. Uh, been very fortunate to have some whiskey from the, you know, that was bottled, bought, barreled in 19, like 15, and then sold in 1930 something. And it was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And so um, it was great. And then it became National Distillers, and National Distillers owned the brands for a long time. Um, it's just as that as they started diluting the brands, like in the seventies and things, and it became a bottom shelf brand. Yeah. Now I'm fairly confident that National Distillers also owned uh, Cedar Brook for a, a long time. I just don't know when it went out of use. Yeah. Well, I had read somewhere. That there was a massive fire at the Cedarbrook Distillery in 1922, and then I'd also heard that Cedarbrook Distillery uh, had just stopped producing in 1922. But then it couldn't have been producing in 1922 because they had to stop production in 1919. And this is what makes history so difficult. And then all of a sudden, I found another article that actually it was a, a legal document that I ran across where I think it was Julius Kessler was involved in a suit where he had lost barrels of Cedarbrook whiskey in a fire and he was try mm. and and the problem was was that and that this might have been the 1922 thing and that basically the reason why he was in a lawsuit was because it wasn't insured but he had been told that it was insured but because of prohibition 
they weren't allowed to insure it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he thought it was insured, but it wasn't, and then it was destroyed, and then he was all frustrated about that. <laughs> well, uh, I don't believe there was a fire when uh, that I know of at Cedar Brook. Actually, we're getting ready to write a blog post here about an article that I found uh, talked about uh, when they did the expansion and when the, they dismantled the distillery. Uh, there was a a block a brick block you know in the distillery and they were they when they opened the block it had the old newspapers from the 1880s um it had some empty bottles a little bit of change it also had the list of all the people that worked at the distillery which is a fascinating list mm. of names to me wb saffle there was a crow i don't know which crow it was that worked there and i'm getting ready to publish that here hopefully in the next month or so uh to tell that story um but from what I understand, um, Julius Kessler loved the Cedar Brook Distillery. Um, I believe he held on to that distillery after, you know, they sold everything for his personal use. Uh, might be what you're talking about with the other article you found through, yeah. you know, during Prohibition. And um, um, it was his crown jewel of, of the things that he, he had. He sold it as the most expensive brand in the portfolio, um, talked about it, like I said, um, you know, it had. T I, I remember an ad from 1910. It talked about how it, you know it was by far the best distillery, you know, of its time. Uh, even its competitors, admittedly, so. And they said it had stood the test of time for 62 years. And this is in 1910, right? Yeah. And so, um, um, and and like I said, I I found the story just so amazing that. Well, I had to figure out to do something, right? So the first thing I did was I, I re-registered the brands. I re-registered the trademarks, um, which wasn't easy, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, um, the first one we – so I did try to do Cedar Brook, which I had to change that one, and it took me a little while to figure out how to change that. That one is W.H. McBrayer Cedar Brook Bourbon, and then that's – we can only make bourbon. Um, we started out with the WH trademark just because he had his first brand was WH, WH uh, McBrayer. And so we, we felt like to honor him and to honor his beginning, our beginning needed to start with the WH McBrayer yeah. um, brand and his story and, and just reintroducing him to the whiskey community. What was really interesting to me was um, I registered the old McBrayer brand and that trademark had expired and that got contested. And it got contested by the Scotch Whiskey Association. Really? And I was like, that's what I said, really? <laughs> and and um, they said, I said, well, what is that about? This brand's been made in the U.S. It's been around for a long time. And they said, well, McBrayer's a Scottish name. And if you put McBrayer whiskey on a bottle, you're going to mislead the public and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So, <laughs> so that is definitely a USA-made product made in kentucky now uh for sure and that's what we plan to do with all our products and uh we were able to 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 work that out but yeah. um i was i was shocked uh how difficult that was uh at the time well uh, if anything i've learned about the scotch whiskey association they are very protective and i guess if it hits a fringe and they're a little worried about it because of course virginia distillery got in trouble for using highland in their name <laughs> and so even just a region name coming over with and and i get that in a way i mean we're we're trying to protect the name bourbon in the united states and you're codifying all these laws to how you can make something and what the you know restrictions are there was a story about a canadian distiller that used the word bourbon like or something like that and they got in trouble for it and so uh, it, it all makes sense but you, know, you, you just kind of hope that they're not going to commandeer last names just because because i mean america is a melting pot and uh, mm -hmm. we got a lot of different nationalities here and definitely a lot of whiskey makers with scotch backgrounds well i i can't just tell you how happy i am we've been able to secure these brands and and put the mcbrayer name back on some kentucky bourbon and and reintroduce our story of our family's history to the to the industry and um what a great industry to be part of i mean it's 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 a lot of fun i mean we're we're very small um but we're we're working on getting a little bigger anyways it's yeah. still small but um 
but it's a lot of fun and and uh, what a great time to be in the business even though it took me several years to to finally launch a product once <laughs> i learned the story yeah um but um i hope it's something i get to do the rest of my life well we haven't even talked about my favorite part of this story yet which <laughs> is we always wonder about mash bills with these old distillers and if you're going to bring back a family brand you know they're to see and and get a mash bill like with the Nelson brothers when they dug into Charles Nelson and the Nelson's Greenbrier and they found out that he was making Tennessee whiskey but he was making a weeded Tennessee whiskey and what a surprise that was and that they had access to be able to find that old recipe well you found your old recipe but you found it in the most interesting of places can you describe that yeah yeah, so as I mentioned to you, I was really deep on the Google, uh, looking for family just pictures and notes and, and things about the distilleries. And I came across um, a blog post, you know, and this is from 2005, Bourbon Enthusiast. Well, if you, there was blogging back then, was not like blogging today, right? Yeah. And it was just like an open forum where you would write notes or whatever. And it was with Michael Veach on it, and he had talked about how he he had a letter with the McBrayer mash bill on it, and I was like, "Do what?" <laughs> and so, um, um, so this was a letter. Um, it's down at the Filson Historical Center in Louisville, and that's when Michael Veach had spent his time down there, and he was going through the the old Taylor files, and he had a letter, a handwritten letter from William Harrison McBrayer to E. H. Taylor. Uh, from 1870, and he, uh, E. H. Taylor, was buying some of his whiskey. He needed some to sell some to pay some of his whiskey taxes, which were pretty new back then as well. And and how that was going, and um, um, and on the back of that letter, he had his mash bill, and it was handwritten. And they talked about him and Chuck Crowder and some other uh, pretty important people in the bourbon community uh, were talking about this this mash bill, and it was an 88 percent corn uh, mash bill. Mm. And and they talked about, um, wow, somebody needs to make this at a low barrel entry proof and do some, you know, some low temperature cooking. And, and I was like, huh, all right. I guess that's <laughs> what the, I know how I'm going to get in the bourbon business, right? We're going to yeah. recreate uh, this mash bill. And so, um, so uh, you know, I was I was working and, and I had all these ideas. That my dad was getting ready to retire. He said, hurry up and retire, dad. We need to figure out how to get in the you know i need to figure out how to make this and i was just going to put a still in my warehouse here in ohio and i realized how that wasn't very easy you know <laughs> and so um so and I, I started looking around and and um he had he had knew a guy that grew bloody butcher red corn and and how tasty the kernels were you know in some uh some different things they were making and um he said man that might make some really good whiskey so we we found a distiller in Kentucky uh, to partner with, and um, took him this letter and said, "Hey, we'd like to make this with some bloody butcher red corn. We want to do a low barrel entry proof, like it talks about here. That's a big thing for Michael Beach. He loves that low barrel entry proof. Uh, so we went, we we used bloody butcher corn, uh, went in the barrel at 105 proof, and I said, you know." I mean, it was so new to me. I was like, well, can you make me, like, one barrel so we can know if it tastes good? <laughs> and they kind of laughed at me. They said, listen, the minimum run we can do is somewhere between 10 and 12. And we got 10 out of it, right? And so our first batch was 10 barrels. And and then I needed to wait a year and a day. And I bottled some one-year-old bourbon and sold it to all my friends and family so I could use it, the trademarks. You know, at the time, we had to put the trademarks in use. And... and you know, when we were bottling it, there was some other folks walking around the distillery that day, um, some pretty, pretty well-known folks in the in the bourbon community, and they said, "Hey, I said you want to try it." And they 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 kind of smelled it and looked at us really funny and said, "You know, what'd you do to this?" And we said, "Nothing." And he said, "Well, how'd you filter?" We said, "We didn't. It just came right out of the barrel. We just used the cheesecloth to make sure we got all the, you know, the the the, the barrel out of it. You know," and uh, he tried it and he said, "Man." This is some really fantastic whiskey. You know, this is some of the best one-year-old whiskey I've ever had. Mm. And we kind of thought it tasted good. And so, so then we had to wait, right? We waited to till it got to be over four years old. And and last April, uh, we finally introduced batch one of W. H. McBrayer. Um, it was five barrels, 
right? So we had 1,075 bottles. We did it at barrel strength, so we didn't add any water to it. It came out at 103 proof, 103.6 proof. And then just a couple weeks ago here this April, uh, we released six barrels. Uh, we had one barrel of our five-year-old. We had some five barrels of our four-year-old, three-month uh, whiskey. And we just did batch two. And it was okay. 1,300 bottles. Uh, we released it to our legacy club that you can get on our website. Um, we have a D.C. retailer that ships it to us to, for us to 43 states. Uh, the legacy club... Uh, those 1,300 bottles were purchased in less than three hours. Wow! On Saturday morning, and so <laughs> we were we were we were so excited about that. We're so happy with the the people that had tried batch one and they really liked it. Got batch two. Uh, we've had good reviews on it. They are a little different, right? Yeah. Because the, the, when you have so few barrels, you know, it just depends on how those things age that year. Um, we we've I've made a little more every year. Uh, you know, I mean, once we knew it tasted good, you know, I went really big time. We made 24 barrels the following year. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, last year we made a couple hundred, so I think we have 350 barrels of this product aging now. Um, we're continue to, to add more to that, and we're also working on uh, products for our other other brands, Old McBrayer and Cedarbrook. Yeah. Okay, so a friend of mine, uh, Todd... Um Todd Ritter from uh, Kentucky, yeah. and I think you know Todd, actually. He mm-hmm. uh, he sent me a sample uh, of Batch 1 a while ago, and then uh, you sent me a, a little extra here for me to, to dive into it. And uh, you also sent me Batch 2, so we'll, we'll go through and do a, a nosing and tasting on, on the two of these. But talk, okay. a, talk about that moment when you're about to have somebody taste even that one-year uh, barrel is there like a, a shiver down your spine like oh man i hope this is good <laughs> uh, i get it still every time i see somebody drinking it oh yeah. i hope they really like it you know um, <laughs> you know um we're really proud of what we're putting in the product um we think it tastes great um and you know hopefully you know our goal is to just put out something that everybody can trust that that is a good product you know everybody has different palates everybody has different things they like you know this is a, a high corn but it's a it's a bloody butcher corn so it's got a different unique flavor to it yeah and um but that's what we wanted right we wanted to do something that honored william harris mcbrayer reintroduced him to the bourbon community of who he was something that for what we could do of what we know today that honored some of the traditions back then we know they didn't have number two yellow dent corn back in the 1800s mm. right um, but they had some kind of heirloom corn, um, whether it was a red corn, which they grew a lot of in Kentucky at the time, yeah. whether it was a white corn or maybe it was a combination, all of them at that time. We don't know. But we did something that was an heirloom corn, right? We have some heirloom uh, heritage rye in there uh, that, that goes for it. Um, so it's 5.8% rye, 5.8% barley. Um, we knew it would have a low yield to it at, at that time frame, so it was a little more grain a lot more grainy, you know, flavors to it. Yeah. Um, um, obviously, today we did add an enzyme to it to get a little bit more yield, but we think that's that was okay. And um, but we haven't cut it. Like we just that's how they did it back then. They drank it right from the barrel. Yeah. And so, so, so we're very happy that we were able to do that. Well, on the on the batch one, mm-hmm. the 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 main notes I guess like a combo of, of butterscotch and and toffee. Um, mm-hmm. But as I kept dragging on it, I, I was pulling in even like I kept going. There's, there's a little bit of oak on this, but it's not uh, it's not really out front. Um, mm-hmm. But maybe like a slight tobacco-y kind of a, a note that I was picking up on on the nose. Mm-hmm. Um, but a, it's it's a little bit sweeter, I think, than batch two, which batch two to me seemed to have a little bit more of the oak standing out in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, and that, yeah. So was there a uh, was there a surprise that the two of them, you know, the the differences that you were finding in the two of them? A little bit, um, a little bit. Obviously, um, they're both you know the same mash bill, but that's just how bourbon is, right? It, that barrel might have been a little bit different the way it aged. It was same rickhouse, different location. A um, couple things could have changed. Um, 
but um, you know we got a lot more fruit flavors on batch two. Um, you know the butterscotch and that little bit of maybe a chocolate covered cherry a uh, little bit there um, in batch one. Um, but you know a couple of those barrels in batch two, we were like, oh my gosh, this is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so you know we wanted to blend them together and 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 uh, maybe those barrels need to get a little bit older. But I mean we did we did add in. Um, a five and a five year three old month in the to batch two yeah and um uh you're drinking batch one now um and but the nose on both of them are just phenomenal yeah right um we think they're phenomenal i mean you sit there and smell that all day long did, did you have a moment there because i you had to make a decision as to whether you were going to batch them all together or maybe do single barrels did you kind of have a uh, a couple of barrels that you went hmm maybe we should hold these aside and do them as a single barrel you know that's that's interesting that you talk about that. Um, so we had we had a gentleman help us on batch one and batch two, same person. Um, so we took the best five barrels of batch one and we blend them together, and then we took the second five and we blend them together. And obviously, uh, uh, the first batch tasted better than the second batch. Uh, but the the blender we had with us, he took two from the other batch and that you know took two away from this, and, and every time that we did that it tasted better combined mm. than any of them did by themselves and so um that was a that was the first time i'd ever gone through that process so i'm really happy that we have people that are able to help us and um, um that is that is where uh bourbon is such a unique thing how people are able to to blend barrels together to get a consistent profile or to to have unique profiles based on different batches um, that's to me the art of blending these barrels together is is just phenomenal. Yeah, and I, it's funny that you mentioned the cherry, and then of course, that, whether it's power of suggestion or not, suddenly there I'm I'm tasting it on on batch one, and then into kind of a there's there's a there's a char to this, but it kind of mixes with the uh, herbaliness of of the rye, mm-hmm. which m- mm-hmm. makes a really interesting uh, flavor combination. Mm-hmm. The um, and you know again this is only that was only four year old product yeah I mean we're excited to see what could happen as this gets to five six seven eight years old um, we don't know what it'll taste like after eight years old if that you know that low barrel entry proof if that gets to be too much or not but you know we hope it's just going to continue to just get better yeah even though we think it tastes great today um, over the next few years we're excited to see what will happen to this whiskey as it as it ages i think that it's inspired that you decided to go outside of standard uh forms of corn and that you found something because when you got 88 percent of your mash bill is corn it's going to have a lot of influence on your final product and it's that's what fascinated me about that little bit of rye spice coming in there is that even with just 5.8 percent Rye, it's still enough to mm-hmm. bring some of that herbaliness to complement what else is going on in the whiskey. I did find that the mash bill to be very interesting, even for its time, right? Because today that's more of a Tennessee whiskey type of mash bill, a really high corn. I mean, we have a couple high corn ones out there now on the bourbon bourbon front, but um, um, again, it was unique, it was different, and that's what we were going for. Um, it, it would have been easy to go down the street and just buy some barrels and throw your name on it. But we wanted to do something. It was a little bit more risky. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not like I started with a pot of gold to, to start this thing. It was, you know, grassroots effort. And um, um, But we're so happy in, of how it turned out. Yeah. I, I, on batch two, I get more fruit notes, I think, on it. Um, a lot more fruit notes. And it's... Again, everything just kind of blends in together uh, it, to create one nice nose on it. It's nothing is really overly standing out. Whereas on mm-hmm. the first one, that butterscotch note is really kind of strong. Here, yeah. it kind of sits back in there and plays nice with all the other scents that are trying to come through. I tell you, we opened up a bottle of batch two the other day. Uh, and, and I could just keep drinking. <laughs> it, it, it is, it is, um, it's kind of dangerous, right? It has a little earthiness to it too, which I find interesting. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that kind of goes with that herbally and, and char character that is on batch two also. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's really nice and amazing to think here's your first real effort at getting a whiskey out to the market. And so you've got other whiskeys also that uh, are either in the works or are out. So what else have you been mm-hmm. working on? Yeah, thank you. Um, so last fall, um, part of our trademarks we talked about, um, I have to show usage of those trademarks, right? So I did source some bourbon um, from the Bar Sound Bourbon Company, uh, a handful of barrels uh, that we use for the old McBrayer product. And so we did release that in the fall. It was five barrels um, of a, you know, 70, 18, 12 um, uh, mash bill. However, uh, what we have been doing is we've been putting to back a high rye mash bill, a 24% rye uh, standard corn mash bill, but we're going into the barrel at 105 proof on those. Okay. So we're, we're really trying to do that low barrel entry proof, more like they did back in the early days, to try to honor those brands. And we're, we're excited of where that's going to go. And uh, so we're excited about that brand. That brand, I get a lot of... Of notoriety from that brand. That brand, uh, the bottle was in the movie Untouchables, mm-hmm. as well as Deadwood. Uh, we have pictures of that on our website under our blog post there about that brand. And and again, most people know of that brand. Um, but our most famous brand, as we talked about this evening, was Cedar Brook. And so uh, we've created that label. We're going to talk about that hopefully uh, soon. Probably with over the next year, we're going to do something under that label and get that out uh, to to the uh, to our community. And um, we're real excited just to have all three labels and how they're all turning out and and using things on the label that really honor our past. Um, the monogram that we use on the WH bottle. Um, I know this is a podcast, but I have a picture of it here. <laughs> so that monogram, yeah. that that monogram was. Um, used on his bottles um, back in the 1800s. Um, the old McBrayer product has the state of Kentucky seal on the on the label, and, and that bottle was from the early 1900s that were re- recreated. And so we're really trying to bring back old-looking labels, doing some old um, processes, you know, when you make, make the product, and just trying to do something that's unique uh, that maybe – separates us from everybody else yeah would you i want to see somebody do this again because when i saw the leonis collection and the the pictures that they had of those old bottles they used to put them in crepe paper with the logo (laughs) on the crepe paper do you think you'd ever uh, experiment with that maybe and uh, see if it could be done well you know uh there's there's a gentleman that has brought back uh some of the plankton reserve bottles that were made at cedar brook so it was plankton reserve hotel and it's got that old crepe paper wrapping the bottles in the case and and maybe yeah you know uh i've seen some of the old decanters that had they were beautiful glass decanters that had cedar brook on them and i actually have picked up a couple recently at some vintage shops and those are fascinating to me too yeah. right and so i you know i i just i'm I, I hope I have a long time, knock on wood, to mess around with this and play with this and just have a lot of fun with it, and um, and hopefully it you know it'll it'll go from a hobby to maybe something I can spend most of my time doing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're in a great industry, as you said. So this is uh, uh, it, it's fun to chat with you, and because you know we're kind of in the same situation where we have our day jobs. Um, but, you know, the, here we are dipping our toe into the world of whiskey, and it's very enticing. Yes. Well, and as I said, I mean, the history for the McBrayer family, to me, just needed to be retold. Rather, what, you know, whatever we make out of our business here, we wanted to get back in the bourbon community um, and retell who the McBrayers were. You had J.H. McBrayer and obviously the famous W.H. McBrayer. I don't know, you know, how they do the whole Bourbon Hall of Fame thing, but I think he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. But, you know, uh, we'll see. We'll be work on that over the next generation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Bill, thank you so much for being on the show and, and giving us a lot of that history and letting me get a taste of your first two batches. And I am definitely looking forward to seeing what you 
produce here in the future. Drew, it's been a, a real pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me.